Okay, so uh, this week, uh, Microsoft announced some AI advancements to do with gaming. Um, I got the invitation. I forwarded it on to Alex. Um, I've been a bit busy since then, so I don't know anything about it otherwise, other than some bizarre headlines that have emerged as a yeah. result. Um, Alex, there seems to be two main uh, news stories that have come out of this uh, announcement of Microsoft Muse. Um, right. They're talking about an AI model that can generate video game visuals and actions. And secondly, uh, comments from Phil Spencer about how this could actually be deployed for game preservation uh right i mean looking at the headline i couldn't help but raise my eyebrow you know roger moore styley i think we've got some pretty strong <laughs> thoughts on that but take us through the presentation you had okay well it was actually a super short presentation okay. uh, i went on there with a lot of other press people um basically they had two parts of the presentation one describing an offline ran model uh of muse uh, which is essentially their idea for prototyping game visuals and actions and scenarios where they trained on a data set of a game whose name I forget. It looks like your typical third person shooter hero, you know, everyone's seen that. It looks like, you know, like the equivalent of like Overwatch in third person. I have no idea what this game is. Um, but they trained on that and they can essentially uh give up situations and users and produce video output video uh that allows you to say like okay what can we do with this can let's increase the the hit points of this person by this much let's see what the the movement is like on this and the idea there is essentially i guess with a large enough training data set and with good enough prompts you could start prototyping game ideas visually uh without having to do any of the implementation yourself. The idea is a bit like, you know, like concept art painting for gameplay without actually coding. I think that's what they're the, the, what they're trying to get at with this original offline model. And I see I can see that as being maybe somewhat of a positive thing for game development. Although right now the use case was extremely specific. It's like, look at this one game, this one type of game. Um, so that is less maybe useful for a broader scope of gaming. But um, the other thing that they showed off was it was a bit weird. Now, this was a real-time <laughs> model of a similar thing, but with a controller input where they, uh, if you've ever seen, there was another, I forget who made it, but there was, Oliver would know better than I would, where there was a, a, a generative model of Doom yeah. where it would have, mm. it was trained on all the art and gameplay actions of Doom and it could like move around. I think it was like, what was it? Like Doom's, it was like, yeah, E1 M3 or, you know, it was like, it was like one of those levels and it would like, you could shoot zombies and uh, you could pick up ammo, but like maybe the ammo counter wouldn't go up or you would turn around and the zombie would be gone or he'd be back. It had a very, like, you, they actually were do, generating a game in real time with this machine learning, but it had very low memory, like how much it could actually remember. It would forget things like an amnesiac, like extremely quickly. And this model they showed off of a similar thing based upon the training in this one game that I cannot remember the name of. Bleeding Edge. Um, <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thank you there, John. Yeah, Thank Alex, so uh, I'm continually amused by the uh, <laughs> attention to detail that we've got here. We've, we've got these fascinating insights, but like basic detail is missing. I'm kind of reminded of uh, BBC series Sherlock, where yes. it, 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 detail is basically stored in his hard drive and anything that he doesn't think is important like the fact that the sun's uh, the earth circles the sun is just is just deleted in favor of uh, information that matters so yeah, yeah for me like yeah like the game like let's, let's be honest the name bleeding edge is well it, anyway, to be fair but, it didn't yeah. last long that particular game no this is true this is true um so yeah everyone forgot about it in it too but the point of what I'm saying here is they showed this model, this real-time model, where you could, like, jump in it. You could move forward. Um, the world would maintain consistency, actually, throughout all these things. They had a concept of 3D space in it. Like, you could jump from from the bottom level to the top of a level of something, then turn around and see the, low, the level below you. 
So it had, it was generating like a concept, a topology of 3D space in there. It had a sense of movement, momentum, and all these things based upon this trained game data, but there were a lot of really big caveats. So it was generating a real-time interactive experience, but it was done at like 100p uh, in a widescreen format at 10 FPS. Mm, okay. And the temporal inconsistency was still there. It wasn't necessarily forgetting things so much in a badly visual way, but like things were like deforming as you would move, right? Like its concept of like the rigidity of space wasn't so high, whether that's a resolution thing or a model thing, I can't tell you. Um, but that is an interesting concept for me, but I'm not sure if I feel like that is the way forward for generative AI models in video games, because it's like, you know, it's starting with nothing. The only input data it has is the training set and then your actions. But I feel like that is like, the abstraction then to make something real is so large that it has to spend so much energy and effort to make something which isn't very good in the first place. <laughs> when you could have like, for example, maybe yeah. like there's already base rendering done, like there's a 3D world already there and then it extrapolates on it. And we've seen that in other models, like uh, for ones that like, or, or like uh, 3D car vision stuff, like where they'll have like a very basic uh, set of like maybe just road data and it'll like, add texture and uh, stylize it to make it look realistic. I think that is a greater uh, usage of this technology. But John, yes, the, this is the I, this is why we heard those comments about this being potentially used for the preservation of old games, because essentially it learned the data of a game bleeding edge and could display it at a resolution and frame rate technically. Right. What I mean, do you before, think about before that? We, before I get John's uh, <laughs> no doubt spicy response, let's uh, let's quote uh, Phil Spencer here. You could imagine a world where, from gameplay data and video, a model could learn games and really make them port and, and really make them portable to any platform run. I think that's really exciting. We've talked about game preservation as an activity for us and these models and their ability to learn completely how a game plays oh without the necessity of the original engine running on the original hardware, I think opens up a ton of opportunity. So, John, take it away. Well, that's the thing is it's, it's difficult to infer from this statement exactly what he's imagining, like what they could realistically do with this as a product. But I don't like the idea of essentially generating something being used in, as he says, preservation cases, right? Because fundamentally, I mean, am I wrong to say that that fundamentally goes against what the idea of preservation is? right yes yeah it's a it's a it's a reimagining literally right it is this is AI. a it's creating a something different they could attempt to recreate something as its own unique new thing but it is not actually preserving what came before it um and i really am concerned with what that could mean in terms of an actual shippable product and i feel like that's not to me, though, I guess if you if you really think about what he's saying, it sounds like he's saying, hey, there's games out there that we would like to have on modern platforms, but we do not have source code. We don't have assets. Uh, we can't port it, per se. And traditionally, that would involve using forms of emulation to overcome, which I still think is probably the more valid thing here. There's also reverse engineering projects. To me, this feels like a different approach to overcoming those challenges, but one that fundamentally would probably yield uh, less, um, you know, accurate results, which would again, invalidate this idea of it preserving anything. So mm -hmm. I kind of feel like we, I want to hear more in terms of what they're actually thinking here, but I'm not enthused by the idea of using this to preserve anything. Uh, everything they said, basically, the only the only use case that I, I found fascinating is the idea of uh, prototyping using some sort of like local generated, you know, trained data set to sort of quickly toy around with concepts in a way. I mean, the idea of in improving the speed of prototyping is certainly not a bad thing. But as far as like using all this to bring something to the player, I'm not sure this brings value 
Right. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of a demo NVIDIA did years ago where they had uh, an AI version of Pac-Man running at 50 frames per second. Oh, yeah. And it was mm -hmm. there was no actual game logic involved. It was full AI that, you know, it was just putting on the screen what it thought Pac-Man would look like and how it would react to input. So that does kind of remind me of this uh, in, in some respects. I love the idea that they're making these kind of, um, um, how can I describe it? Um, they're putting the research and development into this stuff. There's something that one uh, high level technical director once told me, which is that, you know, AI is really great for the like 90 odd percent of the time of, of its outputs, but there's always going to be some degree of error and, um, that degree of error can, you know, actually be quite impactful. So, you know, AI really has to up its game in order to provide an experience that does actually quote unquote preserve. And I don't think preserve is the right no, word. The, fundamentally, that's I what think, it comes I down think to. Simulate. Right? Yeah, simulate. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of. It's the equivalent of of a remaster, if you will, if you want to call it that, or like some sort of re-release. But calling it preservation is just not true because they've preserved nothing yep. here. They've recreated it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know you're gonna whatever this game is that's being reimagined it's going to require a huge amount of input in order to get all of the nuances correct you know the amount of training data involved is, is quite remarkable and um it's quite funny that you know in, in a sense i'm reminded of what's happening with AntStream, which is this streaming platform where it streams retro games and mm. it also seems entirely inefficient because the amount of data they're streaming yes. over, over the cloud is like orders of magnitude higher than the actual data of the original game code and assets exactly. itself. So emulation so much, is yeah. just f much more of a of a um, efficient way to do things. And then when we're talking about um, AI, you know, we're talking about another couple of orders of magnitude more more inefficiency being factored in to make this stuff happen. Yeah, I'm sure at some point it will it, it might make sense and I guess it makes sense to be actively researching this stuff right sure. now. But um yeah, it's it's all a bit bizarre. You're right. It? You're just throwing so many resources at something that can be done more efficiently in another way. Uh the amount yeah. of energy required to generate this stuff is insane. And it's already that's yeah. already true with what you said of Anstream. So many resources are spent on on essentially like if you're streaming a Super Nintendo game or something through there, you're taking like a five twelve <laughs> yeah. kilobyte game and using like gigabytes of data over the long term and like all these server farms and network and like just to send this image data to the user. <laughs> yeah. And fundamentally, <laughs> all of this stuff gets like clearly the real issue standing in in the way of preservation is legal, right? Right, 100%. like they can emulate yeah. this stuff. They can pay people to reverse engineer these projects. We've seen that. Like, imagine like the recent Star Fox sixty four re release. Right, uh, that was re engineered from the ground up. They reverse engineered this thing and created something new out of it. These guys did not do this for money. Obviously, uh, imagine just paying a team to do that. If you really want to bring something back, pay the people and have them do it the right way. This is the kind of work that companies like Night Dive are doing as well, right? These games were not legally out there anymore and not in the traditional sense. You couldn't, uh, they obtain those rights and then they go through the effort of sort of rebuilding these, these new versions of the games, uh, offloading this to like an AI function to some degree just doesn't appeal as some, somebody that is interested in preserving the experience of these games. I just mm -hmm. love I just love the idea of us all having fusion reactors in our house to make this stuff happen. You know, to uh, <laughs> you know, re emulate Panzer Dragoon Saga <laughs> in the modern day. <laughs> it, I mean, this is all like I mean, this is like totally pie in the sky, not realistic. But I guess the 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 foundational research here though is important for some future sure, generation sure. where you've got hollow decks and whatnot, right? Um, where you say, "Give me," you know you know you know a villain who can beat data and like you know the equivalent thing here is obviously bleeding edge running at you know 100p and 10 so, fps but something this something this it. brings to mind and i know not everybody is a, a fan of apple's practices and in, in the past but one of the things that steve jobs always did well as a showman was he would 
t- they would have this developing technology and he would bring it before an audience and create these extremely compelling use cases for why this mattered, right? That was like the key strategy of Apple for a long time. Uh, arguably, they're still trying, but maybe less successful these days. But the the way they're talking about things like this, like Alex, you're right. They should be researching this. It's interesting to research it. There may be use for it, but just coming out to the public and sort of giving these like half answers and like, maybe we can do this. That's not very compelling. I feel, and mm-hmm. it doesn't really create a use case where anybody's excited about this. Right. Like how many people saw this and said, yeah, baby, I, they're going to bring back all these games and it's going to be, you know, are they going to be able to do this and this? That's not, that's not that interesting. They have failed yeah, to present a saying. really impressive, interesting use case to the actual audience. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm looking at this Phil Spencer quote again. You could imagine a world where from gameplay data in a video, a model could learn games and really make them portable to any platform. You know, you could imagine a world and, you know, to quote Han Solo, I can imagine quite a lot. <laughs> but, but, you know, as to, as to whether we're going to see any actual application of this, I quite, I mean, they've got a, a web page on this and they've got some embedded videos on there. And I guess, you know, from a, um, uh, from a more sort of holistic standpoint, the fact that it's able to do this at all is, even if it is like, you know, 100p at 10 frames per second, it is recognizably gameplay. Yeah. It mm-hmm. is it is a pretty impressive achievement, I think. Yeah, that's true. Um, the achievement itself is cool. It's impressive. Yeah. Not to knock that. I think maybe it's a case of a tool that that kind of just needs a much more compelling reason to exist. <laughs> mm-hmm. But interesting nonetheless. It's also interesting that they've chosen to uh, reveal this at, at this point as well. I'm wondering in you know why they're doing that. Um, it would have been a cool thing to do at GDC, for example, as opposed to some sort of standalone PR beat that, that they've done here. 